Good morning, Rose. What day is it today? Oh, sweet, we are back on track. All right, you ready to roll, Rose? Uh, for the most part, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done in your exam, you did really well. Mm -hmm. Hey, Alana. Hopefully we'll get to hear Alana's uh, snoring dog again. Good morning, Alana. Good morning. Do you have your uh, fabulous snoring dog next to you? I do. <laughs> awesome. She's, she kind of, it's a little weird. She only snores sometimes. No. So. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I had my dog sleeping next to me last night, and I didn't sleep <laughs> very well at all, uh, which is kind of funny. See, I used to have a hedgehog, and they're nocturnal, so um, she was running on her wheel all night long, so I learned how to sleep pretty deeply. <laughs> That's funny. All right, so what we're going to do today is uh, start on control of gene expression. And this is uh, pretty chunky, I would say, particularly in prokaryotes. Eukaryotes, there's a, there's a lot of different things going on. I don't have the eukaryotes one open right now. Um, but uh, in prokaryotes, it's, uh, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of new concepts that we haven't hit before and you may not have uh, come across before in you know your prior uh, biology experience so uh, it's a pretty heavy lifting period I would say um, particularly uh, we're going to be looking at two examples and these are kind of classic examples uh, the first one is the lac operon which is uh, an inducible um, uh, type system, right? Because it's uh, it's induced by um, by lactose, and then we have a, a repressible system, which is the tryptophan for metabolite or producing tryptophan. And this one is really tough, particularly the the finer points of it. And so uh, one of the issues with control of, uh, let's get this back up, uh, gene expression is getting your head around about um, things being turned off, things being turned on, things in a default off state because something is bound there or because there, it's a default off state because nothing is bound there, right? And so there are lots of different permutations and it can get a little bit overwhelming you know, with all of those different things together, right? And, and so uh, I would suggest kind of working this through this yourselves as well um, and basically being able to write out what happens in these different systems because that will be what really helps you kind of understand what's going on, right? Um, just as a kind of a panoply of uh, facts, it will be just unintelligible, right? You really need to work through what all these things do to able to be able to make sense of them, right? So, uh, just kind of giving you a heads up there. This is it's actually stuff that took me a while to figure out when I started teaching genetics again um, back in a previous job. is It's not not trivial stuff to get your head around. And so um, we're going to start with prokaryotes first because 
believe it or not, they are actually simpler than uh, eukaryotes in, in many, many ways. Um, but essentially most uh, prokaryotic systems consist of two parts, right? You have uh, the operon, uh, which is the collection of structural genes, uh, promoter, and also uh, something that's called an operator, right? Which we haven't come across yet. This is part of the regulatory system of prokaryotic gene expression, right? And so this is all about producing the polycystronic mRNA, which then produces the multiple different proteins, and those do bumming, different things in that process, right? This example here is uh, a metabolic pathway, and so each of these proteins catalyzes a different step in that pathway. And in addition to that, there will be a second part, which is uh, not necessarily right next to where that operon is, uh, but that will encode a uh, regulator, right? Which may be an inducer, maybe a repressor, uh, maybe an apo repressor, which is a an inactive repressor, which only works when something's bound to it. You know, there's lots of different uh, variations on that theme, right? Does that make sense? It's like a, essentially it's a two-part system. Okay, so um, keep that in mind as we go through, right? And, and typically, prokaryotes also have, uh, I mean, they're, they're not like, oh, they're not st stupid. I mean, they don't have intelligence, obviously, but they do have a pretty fine-tuned way of controlling gene expression. They just do it in a different way to eukaryotes and with a smaller set of tools, essentially. Uh, but what's another very common characteristic of gene expression in prokaryotes is that they have two ways of controlling it. They have a big like on off switch, like which they, you know, like those big uh, circuit breakers in like Frankenstein's monster type uh, scenarios, right? It's like on or it's off. Uh, and then they have a second one, which is more like a dial, right? Where it can fine tune uh, expression between those two states. And so we'll see that both in the LAC operon and in the TRIP operon. Different mechanisms, right? They're not the same, uh, but they're the same principle, right? There's a way of turning on gene expression or off, right? And there's also a way of fine tuning it between those two different states, which makes sense, right? You know, you don't want to go uh, full out making something where you only need a little bit of it. And you don't want to turn it off completely when you need also a little bit of it. All right, so keep those, those things in mind as we go through this process. And we're not gonna do this all today because as I said, it's pretty chunky. And we also um, we can finish this off next Tuesday. So we're now actually officially back on track to uh, the schedule that we had um, before we'll see, we'll see what needs doing out of the last three PowerPoints. How much time we have for those, right? So um, let's get back to where we at. Okay, um, yeah. So essentially, uh, regulation is all about uh, controlling where, when, how much in response to what a gene is expressed. Right, um, and also what happens to that gene product after it's been produced. And so there are lev very many different levels of regulation, right? You can regulate the expression of the gene itself, processing of the RNA if you're a eukaryote, uh, translation of the mRNA, how long that mRNA hangs around for, and also stuff after that protein has been produced, which is called post-translational regulation or modifications, right? And those are really important in eukaryotes. Prokaryotes, um, not so much, not that I can really think of really. Um, so some of these apply more to eukaryotes than they do to prokaryotes for sure. You've also got different ways of thinking about this, right? So um, when we talk about the name, Right, be it negative, positive, inducible, or repressible. 
we're talking about the action of what's being done to gene expression, right? So negative regulation is it's uh, it's having a negative effect, right, on the uh, expression of that gene. So it's turning it off, right? Which means that normally it's turned on, right? So here's again another one of those uh, weird kind of like flip around um, concepts. And similarly, positive regulation. Uh, it's having a positive effect on the gene expression. So typically that gene is off in the default state. You need something to turn it on, right? And that's uh, negative regulation is much more common in prokaryotes. Positive regulation is much more common in eukaryotes. So in most eukaryotes, our genes are always off until they're told to be turned on. In prokaryotes, they typically produce, you know, they would produce all of their gene products uh, in, unless otherwise told not to, right? And so it's, a, it's just a different way of doing things. And that's kind of handily shown here. Uh, positive regulation requires some kind of activator to be turned on. Uh, negative regulation requires um, something to bind and turn it off essentially right so it still both applies to something binding to that regulator uh regulatory region uh but a different effect so anybody have any questions so far give you a chance to kind of uh cogitate i don't think so right now okay. i haven't gotten a chance to look at this chapter yet so this is all kind of new right now Okay, well, you'll need, it'll be worthwhile doing going through this on your own afterwards as mm -hmm. well. Um, and particularly the audio. The audio is a lot more kind of step-by-step -step, uh, approach, essentially. So that's another thing. But uh, yeah, you don't, you want to spend some time on this, without a doubt. Okay. Yeah, I understand, you know, the exam was just on Tuesday. So it's kind of hard to get, you know, wheels turning right after that. And I'm sure you have other stuff going on too. Uh, okay, so in terms of regulation, there's also an extra level of uh, description, essentially. And that would be whether it's inducible or repressible. And so inducible means you need something present to turn it on, right? So it, uh, typically that, re that means Typically, that means that there's going to be a repressor uh, bound to that gene, which will mean it's off normally, right? And so an inducer is something that lifts that repression and allows gene expression to occur. So in expression is induced. Or even more basic, the repressor is induced to leave, right? So that repression is lifted. In repressible, uh, nothing is bound right to that um promoter and gene expression happens normally and then you need a repressor to bind to it in the presence of a co-repressor and that will turn it off so it's then repressible it can be repressed and turned off and so uh at the bottom you'll see a new couple of new words apo repressor and co-repressor so an APO repressor is a repressor that is inactive in its default state. That's different from the repressor up the top, right? In the inducible transcription, that repressor will bind to that operator or promoter and shut it down on its own, right? So that's a repressor. An APO repressor is an inactive uh, repressor, which needs a co-repressor bound to it to become active. And that co-repressor is often a uh, metabolite or even the product of that uh, gene product, right? Like a metabolic product that that operon produces um, is often involved in turning off of that gene expression, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. You know, if you, you have an operon which is involved in producing a particular compound, once you have enough of that compound, you don't need to express the operon anymore. So it makes sense that the, the end product is involved in shutting down gene expression as well. And that's very much the case in uh, the trip operon, right? 
Okay, so uh, this is just a kind of like a pictorial graphic essentially of um, what I was talking about. You know, so here in inducible uh, transcription, a repressor is bound by default, and that repressor is induced to leave by the presence of an inducer, right? And we'll see that in the lac operon, right? The inducer in the lac operon is lactose. And then the opposite being, let me, so essentially if you look at the different outcomes, right? So in the one at the top, inducible transcription, the end result is that you have transcription and that regulator is free, right? In repressible transcription, you start in that state on free of anything and you know no proteins bound and then that co-repressor comes in binds the apo repressor and that turns it into an active repressor and that stops uh, gene expression all right so try and keep those in mind and trying to keep in your in your mind essentially what is going on right hey esmeralda hello sir you know what what is the what is the action that is occurring in terms of control of transcription right is it being induced to be expressed is it being repressed is it being positively regulated and turned on is it being negatively regulated and turned off right so this would be uh, negatively regulated this would be positively regulated for example right even though it involves something that's negative you know so it kind of it, your head can get turned around pretty easily in this stuff okay so um we also have something which i touched on earlier and which we'll see in the actually in both of those uh, bacterial examples lac and the tripoperon um the concept of autoregulation right so essentially the the product that is produced as a result of that gene expression uh, helps turn off that um, the expression of that gene, right? There is that's that's negative autoregulation. You can also have positive autoregulation, but that's uh, kind of a little rarer and tends to be more in um, eukaryotes from from memory. It's typically if you need some a lot of something very very quickly. Right, then uh, positive autoregulation is a good idea. Okay, so some things that are worth bearing in mind, we're probably not going to get to the trip operon today because uh, the lac operon is more than enough to, to uh, work on for today. Um, there's uh, two things worth remembering, right? One is that bacterial mRNA is polycystronic, right? This whole idea of an operon being regulatory region and then a whole series of structural genes, right? So bacterial gene organization is very, very different from eukaryotes, right? It's all together. Now, another thing that's also really, really important is what we came across in the last section, which is that trans transcription and translation in prokaryotes are coupled that's super super important for the control of regulation the, the control of expression of the trip operon right in fact it's one of the one of the main reasons why that the trip operon is used as an example because it's such a good uh example of that you know how that can work right and so in prokaryotes they have a very particular structure for their genes and their, their operons. And also, in many cases, the fact that transcription and translation are coupled is central to how those uh, the expression of those operons is controlled, right? So try and keep that in mind. Those are two big things. And essentially, um, this is, let's just move this out of the way. This is a, the same picture that was on the um title page here's our operon and our in in bacteria operons always consist of uh, a promoter which is where the rna polymerase binds along with the sigma factor 
and the operator, right? This is like the regulatory region, essentially. The operator is the region to which a repressor binds, right? And so that could be a repressor which is then lifted via inducible expression or a repressor which is uh, bound in the presence of uh, a co-repressor, right? So that's a repressible transcription. That region there, that operator, is where that happens. And so this is very much what the LAC operon looks like, right? The TRIP operon is a little more complicated because of stuff we'll get into uh, next week. And then you have your transcriptional genes, right? You also have, and you know, it's kind of obvious what happens then you get your polycystronic mRNA and then you get your multiple uh, proteins and then they do their job. In addition to that operon, elsewhere in the bacterial genome, you will find a uh, repressor or regulator protein, a typically repressors of one form or another, right? And those are produced constantly, right? So they are not really under, their expression is not under control of anything. They're just always produced, probably at a fairly low level, right? Because you don't need gangbusters amounts, but they'll always be produced. And those uh, regulator proteins always bind to that operator region, right? And so you can see it makes sense because uh, if the promoter is where the RNA polymerase binds and there's something bound to the operator, that RNA polymerase can't get through, right? It's blocked. So, and also those two regions overlap. So sometimes even, uh, when a repressor is bound, the RNA polymerase can't even bind to the promoter, right? So you can see why that order exists, right, in the way that it does. The operator is in the middle, right? It's like a, a checkpoint or gateway between the RNA polymerase and its ability to transcribe the uh, structural genes. Okay, so we're gonna follow this format. They look very much like this in the following slides when we look at the LAC operon, right? And there's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of different words and names and things like that. So, you know, oh, that's a good point to pause. Anybody got any questions? Even, you know, small ones that just occur to you. Um, I had a question, um, where on the, gene is this operator or on is it like on the like in the previous lectures we had said that like the regulatory for prokaryotes was like on the left side of the gene is that not the case for this it's on the it's after the promoter to the right so really what we were talking about before in terms of the promoter in prokaryotes was both of those things together we didn't oh, make okay. the distinction between the promoter and the operator largely because there wasn't any need because if you talk about the operator, then you've got to talk about repressors and then we just didn't have time for that. Oh. Um, so in prokaryotes, it's always, and don't worry about left or right, because obviously mm -hmm. genes can go in different directions, right? Um, but the regulatory region is always upstream of the structural genes. Oh. Upstream means before it in terms of the DNA sequence. Right, so here are the structural genes, those are downstream because the mm -hmm. it goes from you know left to right in this case at least. Um, and the regulatory region consists of the promoter and the operator. Promoter being where the RNA polymerase binds, operator being where any regulatory proteins bind. Oh, okay. So you'll remember though that that's different in eukaryotes. In mm -hmm. eukaryotes, we have the same kind of idea of regulatory, you know, uh, region and then your uh, protein coding region, right? Mm -hmm. But in eukaryotes, the promoter, the core promoter where RNA polymerase binds is right next to, right upstream of the, the coding region. And then the regulatory regions are, you know, potentially miles upstream of that, right? So it's, it's the other way around. And that's because of how, um, pardon me, gene expression is controlled in eukaryotes. Typically in eukaryotes, gene expression is always turned on in response to something. Mm -hmm. 
And so there's less need to have things l physically blocking transcription because without those, you know, things turning uh, gene expression on, you're never even going to get RNA polymerase binding. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a, it's a very different, sorry, cat here, um, different way around to thinking about it. And you, in prokaryotes, it's typically a case that you want to turn things off, right, that are always on. And so in that case, you need something physically blocking the process, and that's where the operator comes in. In eukaryotes, you have to intentionally turn things on, right? And so in that case, uh, you don't really need that kind of checkpoint because the control is provided by other regions. Okay, thanks. That, that really helps. Awesome. Okay, so in the trip operon, uh, not trip, lack operon. So... This is all about uh, import and metabolism of lactose, right? Lactose is uh, a mix of glucose and galactose. It's a disaccharide, so two, two sugars joined together like sucrose is, essentially. Um, and so for, actually it consists of three structural genes and we just don't know what the third one is, so we never talk about it. Um, but include essentially what you need to do in terms of being a bacterium is if there is, and it's really worth bearing in mind, like the kind of the bigger picture, right? So what, what's going on? What do the bacteria need to do? And so obviously bacteria need uh, energy and energy is provided typically by conversion of glucose into ATP, right? And so what, Ideally, you're going to use glucose first, right? That's the that's the ideal, right? So if you're you're, you're a bacterium and you're you know you're given a plate of sucrose of glucose rather, then that's what you'd preferentially eat. But obviously, you don't control what food sources are available in your environment. You use what you can make the most of, right? And so if uh, there isn't much glucose around, but you have some lactose around instead. Now you want to kick on or really upregulate um, the ability to use lactose, right? And so, but then obviously, as soon as you have enough glucose, you don't need to do that anymore and you just want to turn it off, right? So that's really the, the picture you need to keep in your mind, right? There's a bacteria, you know, kind of do whatever bacteria do, I don't know, like spiraling around somewhere. Um, and it encounters a new food source and it wants to utilize that food source, but only until it doesn't need to anymore, right? Because it prefers a different type of food, which is a lot easier to use. And so lactose, the lac operon is very much a case of, ah, okay, you'll do, right? Uh, better that than starving. It's kind of like eating stale crackers from the pantry, you know, if you're really hungry. You wouldn't eat them normally, but if they're there and you don't have anything else, then you, you eat those. Um, and so to do so, the bacteria needs to do two things. First, it needs to import lactose into the cell, right? Because lactose is a large molecule. It's not going to get across the cell membrane on its own. And then once it's in the cell, it needs to be able to break lactose down into galactose and glucose. I don't actually know what happens to the galactose, right? Perhaps it gets broken down by some other mechanism or just gets punted back out. Um, but then the glucose is then used to generate energy, essentially, right? So we need, as a bacterium, you need to be able to control that and basically turn it on when uh, there's lots of lactose and no glucose, and then start turning down when there's more glucose being produced, right? It's kind of, there's that big on-off switch, which is, is lactose present or not? Because there's no point producing it if there's no lactose around, even if there's no glucose, right? So if there's uh, no lactose, it's off, right? And if there is lactose, then it's on. And then once that uh, process starts uh, churning through the lactose, it's going to start producing glucose, right? And so now you're going to start turning that dial down a little bit in response to those increasing levels of glucose, right? So it's really uh, 
doing only as much gene expression as you need to get the product that you need, right? Because this is an expensive process. You don't want to do it. Uh, and then just have those proteins around doing nothing, right? That's just uh, wasteful in terms of energy. So anyway, um, there are three structural genes, uh, like Z, Y, and what's the other one? I can't even remember what it is. It's on the, we've got it on the diagram later on, we'll see it. Um, like uh, Z or Z in America is uh, called beta-galactosidase. That's the enzyme that breaks down lactose into uh, galactose and glucose. And like Y, which is the importer, that's called lactose permease. It's what gets the lactose from the environment into the cell. Right, so those are the two, and there's another one, three genes, structural genes in the operon that make the polycystronic mRNA. It's kind of amazing no one's figured out what that third one does by now. This has been studied for decades. Um, and then we have uh, three regulatory elements. We have the LAC-I, which is, I guess, an uh, inhibitor, if you want to use, think about what the I stands for. Um, that encodes a repressor gene, right? So that's somewhere else. It's not part of the operon. That repressor gene binds to the operator, which is called LAC O, and that operator is between uh, LAC P or the promoter and the structural genes. So let's see. Let's what's on this page? Yeah. Okay. So this is pretty much what it looks like, right? So the LAC I. Uh, gene is not shown here, right? It's uh, somewhere else. Oh yeah, it is alpha. I thought it was. Um, so this is what the LAC operon looks like. Oh, it is actually part of that, but it just goes in a different direction. Huh, okay. I forgot about that. Anyway, so um, you've got LAC I, you've got the LAC P and LAC O, which are the promoter and operator, and then you have the structural genes. Right, so normally that uh, lac I repressor protein is bound to the operator and prevents transcription. Right, so this is uh, by default off, right, because there's no point producing this if there's no lactose present, right? There's, you would not get any benefit from that investment in materials. So this system is a positive regulation right because it's the action of the in, of whatever happens is to turn it on and it's inducible right so the inducer here is uh, lactose or allolactose if you want to be fancy and it will bind to that lac i repressor and induce it to leave right which will then free up the operon to be uh, transcribed and so that's shown here, right? So when you have some lactose around, then that lactose binds to the uh, lac I that leaves, and now um, RNA polymerase is able to bind to the promoter, and it will produce the um, the products, the structural gene products, right? Those enzymes and and proteins. Transacetylase. Don't know what that does adds acetyl groups to something there you go lac a function not well understood okay so that's the basic outline uh out, outline there you go of the lac operon right you've got your three structural genes you've got your promoter and operator you've got your repressor and this isn't an apo repressor right because it will bind dna in the absence of anything else right just on its own but when lactose is present, it binds to that repressor protein, that lac I. And you can actually see how um, it kind of binds in a, in a groove. So it actually changes the physical shape of that repressor. And that's why it no longer binds to DNA, because it's binding to DNA is, if you can imagine a bit of like that's DNA, it will bind like that to, I think it's to the minor grooves, I can't remember off the top of my head. And when lactose is, is bound to it, it kind of changes its shape, so it no longer fits, it doesn't bind to the DNA anymore. 
and then you get transcription. So this is the big on off switch, right? No lactose, no transcription. Lactose, loss of transcription, right? And this is like a hundredfold difference. It's a very, very big change in transcription, right? So as soon as that repression is lifted or induced to leave, then uh, you get a huge amount of transcription very quickly, right? So it's, it really ramps up the um, production of these gene products very quickly. Okay, quick pause. Time for questions. So when it's transcribing at the bottom here, is it is it doing it in fragments to create the, the permease and the beta and all of that, is it doing it in fragments or? No, the, the mRNA is, it... is all one piece. So it's a polycystronic mRNA. So the whole, the whole piece, the all three structural genes are transcribed in one long piece, one long piece of mRNA. Then each of those uh, regions in that mRNA cistrons, essentially, right, <laughs> has its own uh, start and stop codon, right, where the ribosome will bind to it and translate it and then fall off. Okay. And so um, that is what then produces those three distinct proteins that you see at the bottom, the beta galactosidase, permease, and so on. Okay, I think that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is it he or she? <laughs> it's a she. It's a she. <laughs> so <laughs> cute. Um, so yeah, so that basically means that all of the transcription is all done at the same time. The translation is coupled to that because it's uh, in a prokaryote, mm -hmm. but they're, they're done kind of semi-independently. But because they're, you know, there's the same amount of each bit of mRNA because it's all one piece, mm -hmm. you'll get more or less the same amount of protein for each one of those three different structural genes. Okay. So it's a very much all or nothing deal. You either produce those proteins or you don't, right? You can't produce one more than the other. They're all tied together essentially, right? Which is called coordinated regulation, right? Um, because all of the different pieces needed to make lactose into glucose are all in that operon. They're all made at the same time. Right, it's not like you have to, in eukaryotes, it's very different. If you want to, I don't know, let's say we wanted to metabolize uh, lactose, each of those would be separate genes in different parts of the genome, mm -hmm. and their expression would have to be coordinated via a different mechanism so that you get all three produced right so it's the need is often the same the means by which is met is very different between prokaryotes and eukaryotes prokaryotes just stick them all together right it's all very simple it's, mm -hmm. like it's on or it's off uh eukaryotes are much more uh it's like a a la carte menu right in a sense, mm -hmm. you know, you always want to have an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's very unlikely you're going to get three desserts if you go to the restaurant. I mean, maybe. It's kind of a neat <laughs> idea, but it's pretty unlikely, right? And so prokaryotes are very much like a uh, menu of the day. You know, this is what you get. This is your appetizer. This is your entree. This is your dessert right okay if you don't like it so it just basically shit. works with what's there right whereas you carrots are very much like well here's the menu and then you can get to pick from all of these different things although typically you'll pick more or less the same things because you want to do the same job mm -hmm. right so uh pro carrots they're all of those things which are involved in one process are all together and they're all transcribed at the same time in one long piece of mrna Mm -hmm. And then they're all translated at the same time. So it's very much like you, you know, you pick a menu off and you, it's got the recipe for, you know, the three different things that you might want, right? You don't get to choose something else. It's either that one or it's something else, right? You don't get to choose the different parts. They all, all produced at the same time. Mm 
And so really, yeah, Thank so really for, for pro carrots, it's a way of, hey, I need to metabolize lactose. Uh, I need to produce all the things necessary to metabolize lactose at the same time. Right. And, and so there's no point. And it's the same with, uh, where's the trip hopper on? Yeah, the trip hopper on is even bigger, right? So there's five in the trip hopper on because it's a meta metabolic pathway. Mm -hmm. And so these all catalyze different steps of that pathway from charisma, I think it is, to tryptophan like at the very end, like the last product produced. And so, so when, when you say it's a metabolic pathway, is this, this transcription and translation, is it creating what's going into the metabolic pathway or is it itself the metabolic pathway? It's creating the enzymes okay. that go into it, catalyze each step of the pathway. Okay. Yeah. To use a particular, uh, substrate or to produce a particular product. Mm-hmm. And so in the case of the trip hopper on, it's to produce tryptophan, right? And so there are multiple steps involved in making tryptophan and, you know, the amino acid. And each of these genes catalyzes one of those different steps. And the last one, trip A, as far as I'm aware, I'm not really sure, to be honest, catalyzes the last step and produces tryptophan from whatever substrate it works on. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's like you get it all at once. You either get the ability to make tryptophan or you don't you don't get you know different parts of that ability it's all mm -hmm. on or it's all off right it's all linked together and they do that by just sticking them all together into one large operon right so there's nothing in here that's involved in the like, metabolism of lactose for example mm -hmm. right uh or production of uh you know enzymes and dna replication because it has nothing to do with tryptophan production. It's only tryptophan uh, production genes, proteins that we produce from this operon. Okay. Yeah. Just kind of neat if you think about it. It's a real handy way of just doing only what you need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, very efficient in a sense. Okay. Rose, Esmeralda, you have any questions? No, I'm good, sir. Okay. Well, if you do, just bring them to the next one. Okay. All right. So remember when I was talking about how there's a big on-off switch for gene expression in prokaryotes, and then there's a smaller dial, right? So the smaller dial is, uh, now this is a whole load of words. Basically, it revolves around the concentration of glucose. Right? So if we go up here, right? So this is the kind of the view of the process in a kind of, you know, in what's actually happening. Pardon me. Right, so we've got the permease that lets the lactose in. And we've got beta-galactosidase, which uh, converts into galactose and glucose, right? So if you need X amount of glucose present in the cell to be able to, you know, make the ATP you need to do to do whatever you need to do. Any more than that is, is excess, right? You can't use it, right? It's unnecessary. And so once you reach a certain level of glucose, you want to start dialing back this whole process, right? Essentially steps one through four. Right. You don't want to stop it completely because, you know, you're going to be using up glucose as well at the same time. So you want to still be able to make more glucose, but you don't, it's like once you get, uh, essentially the big on off switch is it gets you up to that level, right? It's like the big, uh, ascent of a, you know, uh, airliner. Off you go. Um, but then once you hit that kind of, uh, steady state, you want to then kind of dial things down a little bit, right? And so in the lac operon, that, that kind of fine tuning, that, you know, dialing things back a bit to a steady state is done in response to glucose levels, right? Now, glucose can't be detected in and of itself, right? This is the, the tricky bit about the lac operon. However, 
the levels of glucose are inversely correlated, right? So with something else called cyclic AMP, which is, and eukaryotes use it too. It's, all, it's used as a kind of a metabolic health indicator, right? And so when you do a lot of exercise, uh, you know, in like you yourself, your glucose levels will go down and your CA, cyclic AMP levels go up that induces you to turn uh, glycogen into glucose, essentially, right? Uh, and so in prokaryotes, it's used as a, also used as a metabolic sensor. So as uh, glucose levels go up, cyclic AMP levels will drop, and it's the levels of cyclic AMP that are used to fine tune con that control, right? And that's done via what's called a catabolite activator protein, right? So uh, essentially, you know, uh, CMP are, um, is our signal that we're detecting. And the catabolite activator protein is the means by which we detect that signal, right? And how that's translated into action. And that's what's shown here. So basically when, uh, and, and, cap this catabolite activator protein right it's um it's essentially it uh how can i put it it boosts the efficiency of uh transcription john got a question sorry i didn't notice that you joined is a cyclic amp a uh, enzyme or or like what is it uh as far as I, I understand what you're saying as yeah. far as what it does, but is it an enzyme? No, it's a metabolite. Metabolite. Right. So it's uh, it's a similar kind of molecule to like ATP or GTP or any of those. It's a uh, it's a kind of a nucleotide. Yeah, it's a uh, ad adenosine monophosphate. There you go. Um, it's funky because it makes a ring. That's why it's called cyclic. Um, but it's uh, essentially it's produced. I'm not sure I need to look into this because I, I think I knew this at one point, but I can't remember it anymore. Um, but its uh, its levels increase when uh, glucose decreases. I can't actually remember why. I'll need to look into that. I'll, I'll look into it and I'll, I'll kind of report back uh, for next class. Um, and so that metabolite binds to the cap protein, right? So essentially this is the, the CAMP is the signal, the catabolite activator protein is the means by which that signal is detected, right? And so essentially when uh, glucose is high, uh, uh, sorry, lactose is high and glucose is low, you're gonna have the presence of uh, lactose. So your LAC-I repressor is not gonna bind, so you get transcription. And you'll have uh, lots of cyclic AMP2. Let me just, so I can see what I'm, here we go. So you have lots of cyclic AMP2, so you get that cap protein. Also binds to the, um, kind of like near to the promoter. And that makes the polymerase, uh, the RNA polymerase bind more effectively and more transcription occurs, right? So when you have those two conditions, remember high lactose, low glucose, effectively what you have is high lactose, high cyclic AMP, right? And so you have the absence of the repressor because lactose is binding to it and making it leave and you have lots of cap protein binding to the promoter. So you get uh, like the, the double whammy essentially, right? You have lots of transcription because transcription is now not blocked by the repressor. And you have lots of transcription also because the cap protein is helping that process along. Does that make sense? It's like, you know, both feet on the accelerator in a sense. Okay. So however, once that goes through, right, you know, you're gonna start uh, 
transcribing that operon, you're going to start producing the enzymes and you'll start producing uh, glucose, right? And so you're going to have lots of lactose and then your glucose is going to start kind of increasing up, right? And so it doesn't really matter how much lactose you have. If you have enough glucose, you don't need to express the lac operon so strongly, right? And because the lactose, op uh, the glucose levels are going up, at the same time, the cyclic A and P levels are going down, right? So those uh, cyclic A and P molecules, you can see down here, they don't bind to CAP. CAP doesn't bind to the promoter region. And so the RNA polymerase doesn't bind to the promoter as efficiently. Now, it doesn't mean that it stops. It's not like it's turned off, right? This is, again, the idea of it being a kind of a fine-tuned dial, right? Uh, it just means it doesn't bind as efficiently. So transcription of the LAC operon will decrease. It's not going to stop. It's just going to decrease. And so if you think about it, uh, essentially, it's almost like cruise control, right? You know, when you're on the, the highway, you're already at your cruising speed. All you need to do is control the speed in response to, you know, either going up a hill or going down a hill, essentially. Right, and so um, what's happening now is, right, you've already got up to speed. You've produced uh, all the components needed to make lactose. You're making glucose. You're utilizing this new food source. But once you start producing enough glucose, okay, now you're just going to uh, kind of tweak this, right, depending on uh, how much that glucose is used, right? So if, for example, the bacterium is being very metabolically active, right? It's got a, a flagellum, which it's powering. It takes a lot of ATP to power a flagellum, right? So it's kind of scooching around a lot in the med medium doing whatever bacteria do, right? So it's going to be using up that glucose. And so a cyclic AMP levels are going to be somewhere in between this, uh, these two states, right? So you're going to get an intermediate amount of uh, transcription of the lac operon to maintain glucose levels at about the right steady state. Now, if that bacterium just stops, goes, whew, yes, enough of that, I'm all tired, tuck it out, then uh, basically glucose levels will start increasing again, right? Because you're still converting this lactose into to glucose. Cyclic AMP levels will decrease, and so transcription will then kind of go and it'll slow down just to maintain that small amount of glucose that needs to be produced, right? So it's a, if you think about it, you know, like in your own driving, right? Because I imagine you all can drive. You know, you don't drive constantly with either full throttle or no throttle, right? Because, uh, I mean, I, I know some San Antonians do for some reason. Uh, some of them are complete nut jobs. Um, but most people, you know, you, you only go full throttle when you need to accelerate, right? To get from a stop or to merge on a freeway or whatever. And then you just kind of modulate it just to maintain a certain speed, right? And it's very much the same in the case of transcription in prokaryotes, right? You need to get up to speed to be able to utilize whatever food source or produce whatever uh, uh, metabolite is needed, right? But then once you get up to that, then you're going to just kind of keep things uh, really just at the level that are required, right? You, you're not going to uh, keep the throttle full on because then you'll just end up producing more of stuff that you don't actually need. Does that make sense? I just came up with that analogy. Hopefully it works. Works for me. Good. Yeah, I think it makes it a lot simpler the way you put it. Yeah. And if you think about it, so all of these uh, processes have a cost, right? You know, uh, transcription, you obviously need uh, to produce uh, RNA nucleotides. You need to provide the energy to power the RNA polymerase. Same for translation. Amino acids cost 
a lot to make or to acquire. Uh, and I think bacteria typically can make all of their own, right? So there's metabolic costs involved in making those amino acids. So you don't want to do any more of this than is absolutely necessary. Because if you do, that's going to impose a cost which is going to reduce your fitness. And so other bacteria around that have a tighter control on things will succeed over you in kind of uh, uh, competitive terms, right? And, um, and so that's why you have to control this so carefully because you really don't want to spend any more, you know, kind of biological money than you need to doing this any more than is, is necessary. And actually it kind of ties, I just had a, another example occur to me, if you, you probably all know about uh, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, right? And uh, how you're told to, you know, you take your antibiotics for the full period, like seven days or whatever. Um, but the thing is that the reason why you don't want to be taking antibiotics all the time is that when you're taking antibiotics, that resistance, that antibiotic has a selective advantage, right? You survive, right? Or continue to grow. Whereas all of your peers around you that don't have that resistance mechanism die or don't reproduce, right? So you get a selective advantage, right? But as soon as that antibiotic disappears, right? There's no, uh, there's no selection for that ability. But if you keep producing the, the proteins or whatever that degrade antibiotics, that has a cost, right? And so you, what you'll actually find is that even when bacterial resistance appears, if you don't use that same antibiotic again for a long time, slowly that resistance ability will start disappearing, right? Because it carries a cost. Even just making that little bit extra bit of DNA, right? that encodes the bacterial resistance gene, over time, that imposes a cost which makes that bacterium less uh, competitive, right? So it gets outcompeted by other bacteria around it, right? So there's a lot of selective pressure, kind of evolutionary pressure that goes into these mechanisms because they have evolved in response to the need to use only what is necessary to do get the job done, right? And so uh, that's why the lac operon is off when it's not needed, right? Because if you're not on lactose, then there's no point producing the, the components that will metabolize lactose, right? And then once you turn it on, you're only gonna use it just as much as is necessary to produce the amount of glucose you need, right? And that's where the cyclic AMP and the catabolite activated protein come in to kind of, you know, fine tune that. And we'll see the exact same thing when it comes to uh, the trip operon, right? Which is, it's kind of trippy, right? Uh, it's a little bit uh, trickier to get because it's again, a little another level kind of up in complexity above the lac operon. Okay, so uh, there's a lot to take in. Right, I, I, I fully appreciate that. So what I'd suggest doing is just go through the PowerPoint again, listen to the audio uh, walkthrough, which is a little bit more linear, a little bit less kind of jumping around. And then try and write out the different states of the lac operon. You know, glucose present, no, uh, sorry, glucose present, no lactose. Uh, lactose present, no glucose lactose and glucose present, right? What are, the, what are the different outputs in terms of transcription and how are those outputs achieved? If you can do that, then you'll completely understand the whole, uh, the whole process. And if you can't, just bring that to class on Tuesday and then we'll, we'll go through it because we're gonna have the whole class for the trip operon. So we'll have time to go over the lac operon at the beginning of that. Right, so kind of put together, you know, any uh, questions and ideas that you have, then that'd be a good idea. Cool beans. Does anybody have any questions before we go? Uh, 
what causes uh just i'm writing my notes right now what causes the uh like the catabolic or uh catabolite repression that you're I, I believe you you touched on it for a second but uh the catabolite that we're talking about is cyclic amp cyclic amp is what cause what rep represses oh hang on catabolite repression no that's um where's that Catabolite repression, catabolite repression. Uh, so cyclic AMP is not involved in, it's not so much a repression, it's lack of induction, right? So uh, when there is little glucose present, you'll have a lot of cyclic AMP. You'll have a lot of uh, catabolite activated protein binding to the promoter and uh, promoting transcription. So when glucose levels goes up it's not so much that there's going to be an increase in repression it's going to be a decrease in induction right so essentially the foot gets lifted off of the accelerator right rather than being pressed down on the brake right to stretch that analogy further uh, okay cool yeah thanks so the repression that occurs in uh the lac operon is the binding of the lac i repressor to the lac o operator in the absence of lactose that's the repression that occurs in this system however when we get to uh the trip operon then that's different that is a repressible system lactose is more of an inducible system right it's more turned on than it is turned off. So really, if you want to reduce the uh, amount of transcription, you reduce the amount of turning on, if you see what I mean. You don't increase the amount of turning off. Just, it's again, it's, you have to kind of get your head around how these different perspectives work, essentially. Thanks. Welcome. All right, ladies and gents, I'm going to call it a day here. Again, uh, any questions, just make a list of them. Uh, bring them to the next class and we'll go through them there. Right, try and work through it on your own as best you can too, because that will also help. Uh, and then I'll post this video to uh, YouTube in a little bit once I've converted it to the right format. All right. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Good to uh, hear you all again. And uh, yeah, have a great weekend. See you on Tuesday. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Oops. Let's get rid of that.